Welcome to the Complete Python course, where you will learn how to code and use Python like a professional software developer. My name is Jose Salvatierra, and I'm a software engineer that's worked at one of Scotland's leading tech startups. I started teaching on Udemy back in 2013, and since then I've made helping students my full-time job. So why learn Python at all? Over the last few years, Python has become more and more popular, booming in the job market. It's also super versatile. You can use it for anything, like machine learning, web development, desktop app development, automation, and so much more. Python is one of the most loved programming languages and also the most wanted language according to recent industry surveys. If people aren't using Python already, they want to start using Python. With this course, you'll learn modern Python and get ahead of the masses. And by the end, you will be a confident software developer who can tackle any Python topic and industry. Python is a great first language because it is simple and that means you can focus on real-world projects and applying your skills. Many courses cover just the basics, and when you're done with them, you can't really make anything. In this course, we'll not only cover the fundamentals, but then we'll guide you through building multiple real projects to give you all the tools you need and code like a professional. That is the focus of this course. We'll use Python to work with files, emails, databases, web apps, desktop apps, automation projects, web scrapers, unit testing, build our own data structures, and we'll even learn about asynchronous development with Python. Throughout the course, we have dozens of coding exercises that will let you type your code directly in the Udemy platform and correct it instantly. And for any student who wants it, we also conduct code reviews, that's professional software developers doing that, and give you personalized feedback. In this course, you'll not only learn all of the knowledge you expect from a course of this caliber, you will finish the course with a strong sense for clean, efficient, and effective Python code. Join the course and start coding in Python today. Check out the next video for an overview of what you'll learn. Hi and welcome to the curriculum overview. Just a quick video to show you what we're going to be building in this course. We're going to build projects and we're always going to be working with a project. The first project we'll build is a movie collection system to manage your movies. We'll learn about Python basics, how to interact with users and send them data and get data back. We'll also learn about if statements to control the flow of our programs and also about functions and loops. Functions will allow us to structure our programs nicer and loops will allow us to repeat things over and over again. Then we'll move on to project number two, which is going to be a library manager. Here we'll learn about object-oriented programming, which is a cornerstone of modern software development. We're going to learn about errors and how to handle them in Python and also how Python does flow control using errors as well as if statements as we learned earlier on. We'll learn about files and how to store things, and we'll also learn about relative imports and import errors. Then we'll do an extension to this project where we'll include database interactions, context managers, and type hinting, which is a new feature in Python 3.6. After this project, we'll move on to web scraping. Web scraping is just extracting data from websites so that we can use it in our own programs, and we're going to learn a bunch of these skills in order to do that. We're going to look at built-in functions, generators, regular expressions, working with date and time, advanced data manipulation, as well as some external libraries that we'll need in order to perform web scraping. Throughout the entire course, as well as building these projects, we'll also be learning a lot of advanced Python knowledge. One of the topics unique to this course is that we'll be covering how to do asynchronous Python development, which is usually a very confusing topic that we will cover in depth. We'll learn about how to use Python in the wild, how to manage your projects with Python, how to do web development using a very popular library called Flask, and we'll also learn about algorithms and data structures and how to implement those with Python. This is very useful for interviews, for example. There's also a bunch of popular Python libraries that you can use to do a whole host of other things, and we're going to look at some of those so that you know more about what you can do with Python. 
This is the most complete Python course available today. We're going to do concise explanations with a little bit of theory, then we're going to give you a whole bunch of examples, and finally you're going to apply your knowledge by building a project, and we're going to do this over and over again, so you're always getting practical, up-to-date knowledge. Thanks for joining me in this video. I'll see you on the next one. Hi guys, and welcome to your very first lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be setting up our cloud coding environment so that you don't have to install a bunch of stuff just as you're getting started. REPL8 is the editor we're going to be using, and it's really powerful and really flexible. To get started, come to REPL.it and create an account. Once you have logged in to REPL8, you'll see something more or less like this. At the top right, you'll have a button to create a new REPL, as well as your REPLs, which should be empty for now, languages, and your profile. We're going to click on New REPL. Here, we're going to select Python. Notice that there's a bunch of different Pythons, including an older version of Python, as well as other frameworks and things like that. We're interested in just normal Python. This is going to create a new editor for you that uses Python 3, and it's going to be what we'll use throughout the entire course. You can give it a name and you can give it a description so you remember what it's about later on when you see it in your profile. When you create your REPL, you'll see something like this. You've got your files on the left, you've got your code here in the middle, and then you've got the output of your code on the right. For now, we're not going to be using files, so you can click this little icon to close it down. By clicking at the top, you can edit the name and the description if you didn't do so before. And whenever we type some code, you can then press the green button to run it, and then you'll see any output of the code on the right. One of the great things about REPL8 is that you can share your editor with someone else. So if you ever have any problems as you go through the course, you can create a new topic in the course Q&A, give us a description of the problem and what you're trying to achieve, and then also paste in this link that you get here. Then we will be able to see your code as you see it. When you do that though, remember to not change your code after you've shared it with us, otherwise your Q&A and the code that we see will no longer be in sync. Every time you start a new lecture of this course, I recommend you create a new REPL for it. That's it for this video. Now that you're all set up, let's get started learning Python. I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to be learning about variables in Python and how to show information to the user. After all, programming is mostly about taking data in from users and giving them data out after doing some processing. So being able to show users some data is an essential part of coding. Let's begin by defining a variable. I'll say age equal 30. This is how you define a variable in Python and give it a value. You first state the variable name, then an equal sign, and then the value that you want to give it. If you want to print an age, all you have to do is say print, and then inside brackets, the thing that you want to print out. So here we've created the variable age and given it the value 30, and then we are going to print it out and show it to the user. All Python programs start off by running on a text console something like what you see here on the right. What that means is that for the foreseeable future, all our Python programs are going to be dealing in text. They're going to receive text from the user and they're going to show the user text. If we run this program, you'll see that 30 gets printed out because that is what our program does. I will be keeping this code for you to see. So if I'm deleting things and moving things around, don't worry about it. You'll be able to see the complete code in the resources section just linked so you can go and have a look. Instead of printing age, you can print 30 directly, and that's totally fine. It means exactly the same thing. Because age was a name for the value 30, you can just use the value 30 directly, and this will always be the case. Instead of a variable, you can always use the value that that variable refers to.
However, there is a key benefit of having variables, which is that if you define an age variable to be 30 and then you print it out, then you can change the value and print it out. And now you only have one variable or one name, but initially it was a name for the value 30. And then in line four, we changed it so that the name age is now a name for the value 40. So if we run this, you'll see that 30 gets printed out first, as we do in line two, and then 40 gets printed out after. So this is just how variables work. You give them the name, then an equal sign, and then the value. If you want a longer variable name, for example, something like friend age, usually in Python, you will use the underscore character to separate different words. In other programming languages, you may do something like friend age like this, but Python developers don't like that. We use friend underscore age. And variable names can contain underscores and they can also contain numbers if you'd like, but they can't contain anything else. So you can't put dashes in them or any special symbols. In addition, variable names cannot start with a number. Here's another example of a variable that uses this type of separation between words. In programming, this type of separation is called snake case. So maybe something to remember in case you want to search for it in Google later on. If you have a variable name that you are arguably never going to change, then we usually write those all in uppercase letters. So for example, the number pi, which is 314159, you would write that all in uppercase because you're never going to want to change it. This is just a convention. And what it tells you when you're reading this program is that this is a constant. So it's never going to change. You can still change it though, but it is just not recommended. Another example would be something like this. When you do radians to degrees, this defines a new variable and the value is 180 divided by pi. So this is how you create variables and give them values. Now we're going to be looking at numbers in a bit more detail so that we learn more about how mathematics works in Python. I'll see you in the next video. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how to get help if you need it in this course. If you have a question about something covered in the videos, be that an explanation or some of the code in the videos, or you've been typing along with the videos and you've had a problem or something like that, or if you have a question about a coding exercise in the course, please ask those questions in the course Q&A. That's the best place for them so we can get back to you quickly. However, if you're going somewhere more advanced, you have a question about your own project, or you want some feedback on your own code, or you just want to chat with other students, ask them about their journey, or help them, or get help from them, and so on, then go into the Slack community. The Slack community is also the place for if you are still stuck after getting an answer in the course Q&A, and you want something a bit more involved, the Slack community is there for that. If you don't know where the Slack community is, I'm going to put a link in the resources section of this lecture. So let's go and have a look at that. So when you're taking the course, you're going to see a screen like this one. You've got the video player here on the left, and then you've got your course curriculum on the right. If you hover over the video, you'll see the controls appear, and there's a few really important ones. The first one is the playback rate. So here you can adjust the speed of the video. If you think I'm speaking too quickly or too slowly, you can change this so that I'll go faster or slower, just to help you understand things a bit better. Similarly, you can go backwards and forwards in time, and you can save a bookmark. When you save a bookmark, it will appear under your bookmarks tab just underneath. Then you've got your audio controls, of course, and you've got a transcript, which is a text version of what I say in the video. And you've got something very important, which is the captions. A caption is some text that appears describing what I say. So I've got English captions for all the videos. These are all handmade by a professional captioning team. So if you want captions to further understand what I'm saying, or if you need the captions for accessibility purposes, you can find them there. That's a really good feature of this course. Finally, you've got your settings where you can adjust the quality of the video. Videos are capped at 720p, but if you go to auto, they can go up to 1080p, which is higher quality. If you are looking at a programming video like these, 
I cannot recommend going anything lower than 720p just because the text is going to start to get a bit blurry. So if your text is blurry, just make sure that the 720p is selected and then it won't be blurry anymore. If you have any technical issues within a lecture, such as the video is not playing or the audio sounds very weird, then you can, in the settings, report a technical issue. I make the videos and the course content, but it is Udemy, a separate company, that deals with maintaining the platform and allowing you to watch the videos and handles your purchases and all that stuff. So I just make the content, they handle the platform. Now, regarding the resources section of each lecture, you've got it on the right under the lecture itself. Here we are in the lecture called Variables and Printing in Python, and you can see that it has some resources attached to it. So if you click on that, you'll see the resources there. The lecture that you're currently on has some resources as well, such as the address to our Slack channel, so you can click on that to go there. You can always skip lectures ahead or go back if you need by just clicking on the appropriate lecture. Now let's talk about the Q&A. The Q&A is a great feature of this course. The first thing to do is to go over to the Q&A tab by scrolling down and then you can see in the current lecture that you're in all the questions that other people have asked. So, for example, uh, Vivek here had a question about strings and you can click on it to read what he asked and maybe learn something from it or uh, just help him out if you know the answer. You can always add your answer there as well. If you want to ask a new question because your question is not answered in here, you can always click the button and type here a question title, for example, why is this not working? And then Describe what you're trying to do, where you're getting stuck, and give us your code. Your code, you'll see, you can always share with us. If you can include any images uh, to help us help you, then that's always good as well. Finally, if you're pasting some code in here, do select it all and press this icon. This icon is for text formatting as code, and it's going to make the code much easier to read. The thing I recommend before you create a new question is always to search because often you'll be able to find the answer to your question just by searching for it. We answer a lot of questions and sometimes some of them are duplicated, which means that you could have found the answer to your question by searching first. For example, you could find something about division here and the search will find you questions that have that in the title or in the content. So going through those when you have a question about a particular topic can be really helpful. Together with our videos, we've also got a short Python ebook that can help you learn the content of the first few sections. An ebook is good because it allows you more time to read through and understand it, and also it provides different explanations to the ones in the videos. So if you want us to explain something in a different way, then reading the ebook can be a great way to achieve that. In addition, the ebook comes with its own programming challenges and programming questions that you can complete as well if you want. That's it for this video though. Thank you for joining me. I hope this has been useful, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to learn about numbers and mathematics in Python. You've got two main types of numbers and that is integers or whole numbers and floating point numbers or numbers with a decimal place. For example, if we do age equal 35, this is an integer. And if we do pi equal 3.14159, this is a float. Notice that the variable name itself is largely irrelevant in this explanation. What matters is the value. Here we've got a whole number, a number that doesn't have a decimal place. And here we've got a number with a decimal place, so this is a float. Anywhere in Python, you can also use the hash symbol to write a comment. So here we have something called a integer, and here we have a float. And what happens is when Python goes through this code, it ignores everything that comes after the hash symbol. So you can use it to write comments for yourself, to remind yourself of what things are, or as notes for studying later on. Mathematics works just as normal. So we can have a variable called maths operation and make it equal to 1 plus 3 times 4 divided by 2 minus 2, making use of all the major mathematical symbols. And just as in normal maths, the 
uh, PEMDAS or BODMAS rules are followed. So multiplication is evaluated first, then division, then addition, and then subtraction. So here we would have 12 divided by 2 is 6, 1 plus 6 is 7, minus 2 is 5. And you can verify that by printing it out. So I'm going to press run now and we'll see 5.0 gets printed out there. This is an important part of mathematics in Python because whenever you do division, you always get a float. Even if the result is essentially something 0 0.0, which is basically a whole number, you always get back a float. So if we do something like float division and we say 12 divided by 3, then we print it out. And I'm just going to delete this code here for simplicity. So if we do something like this, you'll see that we get 4.0 back. If you want to get rid of the floating point or the decimal place, you can do integer division. So here I'm going to create a new variable called integer division. You can call it whatever you want, though. Remember, these are just names. And I'm going to do 12 divide divide 3. And what this does is it performs a division and then removes everything after the decimal place. So this can come in handy at times. So if we run that, you'll see that you get 4.0 first from this first print statement and then just 4 for the second one. Notice that if we change this to 8 divided by 3, the floating point division is 2.6, but the integer division is 2. This here does not round the numbers up and down. It just removes everything after the decimal place. So this is something to keep in mind as you do integer division later on. That's everything for this video. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to learn how to get the remainder of a division. And that is going to allow us to find out whether a number is odd or even. And that itself has a number of uses in programming. So let's get started. I'm going to create a variable called integer division and make it equal to 13 divide divide 5. Remember that when we do integer division, what we're doing is we're performing normal division, so 13 divided by 5, which gives us 2.6, and then we're dropping everything after the decimal place, so that means we end up with 2, because 5 goes into 13 twice. If we print this out, then you'll see that the print output is 2. Now, if we wanted to get the remainder of the division, which is 3, then Python gives us a nice way of doing that with the modulus operator. Let's get the remainder of this division by doing 13 modulus 5. Notice that this modulus operator is the percent symbol. When you do 13 modulus 5, Python will divide and then calculate what is left over. So if we print the remainder, then you'll see that the output will be first 2 and then 3. There you have them. So again, if we want to find out whether a number is odd or even, we can use the modulus operator. Have a look at these numbers and see if you spot a pattern. We've got the number 10, 14, 6, and 340, all of them divided by 2. What would the remainder of this division be if we evaluate it? And for all of these numbers, which are all even, the remainder of division by 2 is always 0. That is what characterizes even numbers as even that when they're divided by 2, there is no remainder. Similarly, if you get some odd numbers, you'll see that the pattern is inverted in a way, and you get 11 divided by 2, 27 divided by 2, and 3 divided by 2, and the remainder in all of these cases is always 1. For example, for 11 divided by 2, 2 goes into 11 5 times, you get 10, and then 11 minus 10 gives you a remainder of 1. So again, for every even number, the remainder when divided by 2 is always 0. And for every odd number, the remainder when divided by 2 is always 1. So we can use this knowledge to check whether any arbitrary number is odd or even. Let's say we've got an arbitrary number 37. This could be the user's age, or it could be the row number in a table, or something like that. And then we want to calculate whether it is odd or even. What we have to do is we have to get the modulus operator and calculate the remainder of this number when divided by 2. So we will say remainder equal x percent 2. Now, notice that we've got this variable remainder, which we used earlier on. That's totally fine. This is just a variable name. You can call it whatever you want. You can even reuse a previous variable name, and that's fine. 
what we've done here is we've got the value x modulus 2, which is the remainder of the division. And we've said that the remainder variable that we created earlier is now a name for this value. So that just reassigns that variable. If we print it out, you'll see that the output should be 1. But before running, I'm just going to delete this code here. And now let's run this. You see that we get 1 back, which tells us this number here is odd. Think about this. Have you ever seen a table online where each row has a different color? So for example, the first row is gray, second one's white, third one's gray, the fourth one's white. So you've got like this sort of pattern. This is a perfect example of where the remainder or being able to calculate whether a number is odd or even comes into play. They are probably using this to only target the even rows and color them in a gray background. Throughout the course, we may also encounter other instances where this can be useful. But that's it for this video. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys, after this video, you're going to be tackling your first coding exercise in this course. I just wanted to tell you a couple of things about coding exercises before you get started. The first thing is, the coding exercises have very specific briefs or assignment tasks. Make sure to follow them to the letter because the testing code that is verifying that your code works is expecting you to follow the assignment brief exactly. So if we ask you to name a variable a certain thing or to calculate certain values or to print things out, make sure to do that fully. And don't print out anything that we don't ask you to print out because that's going to confuse the code checker. All right, that's everything for this video. Good luck in your first coding exercise. I'll see you soon. Hi guys and welcome back. Very often in our programs we'll be dealing with numbers, but almost as often, if not more, we will want to deal with text. The user will be giving us some text that we want to interact with, we will be doing some processing on it, we will be wanting to print some text out to the screen, and that is where the next data type comes in. In Python, we've got another type called strings that are used to contain text, like characters, symbols, numbers, or anything else we want. Here's our first string that I'm going to call my string, and it contains the value hello world. So a couple of things about this string is that it is surrounded by double quotation marks. You can also use single quotation marks if you like, but it's important that the start and the end quotation mark match, so they have to be the same. You can't mix and match them. So this here would be invalid because the start quote and the end quote are different. I like using double quotation marks, but that's just me. You can use whichever one you like. This string here contains the characters H, E, L, L, and so on, including the comma and the space and the exclamation mark. When Python looks at this string, it knows nothing about it. It doesn't care what its contents are. It doesn't have any meaning like the number 30 does because you can do maths on it, for example. A string doesn't have any intrinsic meaning for Python all it's used for is to carry these characters. For example, you can use it to print some information out to the user, like hello world. If you wanted to print that out, you can store it inside a string and then print it. As an aside, remember you can always use the value itself instead of a variable inside the print function here if you prefer. Sometimes you'll want to use one quotation mark or the other depending on the contents of the string. So if you've got a string with quotes, then you'll want to use the double quotes, such as hello, it's me. Here you definitely want to use the double quotation marks on the outside because you've got a single quotation mark on the inside. If you were to use single quotation marks throughout, then this part here is not included in the string because the string ends here. If you run this, you'll get an error. Similarly, you may want to use the single quotation marks on the outside and the double quotation marks on the inside in some occasions. For example, if you have something like this. Here we've got a string, and inside the string, we've got a bunch of characters. 
Once Python realizes that you're dealing with a string, you can put whatever you want inside it. And in this case, we are putting the quotation marks inside it. He said, and then open quotes, you were amazing yesterday. This is totally fine because these quotation marks here don't signal another string to Python. They are just a character inside the string. Finally, if you really want it to always use the same quotation marks, you can do. So I'm going to turn this into a double quotation mark string, and now you can see that these things here are not part of the string. They are colored differently. However, if you put a backslash in front of these quotes, Python will no longer treat them as characters used to signal a string. Now they are part of the string itself. I highly discourage you from doing this, but you may see it every now and then in code, so I wanted to tell you what it means. When you do this, this is called escaping, and it's quite a common thing to do in some occasions, but when you're dealing with strings like this, I would always recommend that you invert the quotes. We also have multi-line strings for when we want to print something out that's much longer. So we will have something like a multi-line variable, and here we are going to use three quotation marks. And then we can print whatever we want inside it. If we print this out and we run it, you'll see that we get multiple lines printed out. So we've got the hello world, then we've got an empty line, then we've got my name is Jose, welcome to my program, and then we've got another empty line as well. Multi-line strings are very useful when you have much longer pieces of text that you want to print out. And also they can be useful at times as comments. Earlier on in the course, we saw that a comment is signaled with a hash symbol. So you can write something here to tell yourself what this file is about. But similarly, sometimes you have a longer comment. You want to write multiple lines of notes. And for that, it is quite common to use one of these multi-line strings. So why is this? Why can you do this? Well, what this does in Python is it creates the string and then that's it. You don't assign it to a variable. You don't use it anywhere. This is totally fine to do in Python. And we can use a multi-line string like this that doesn't have any usefulness inside the program to leave a comment for ourselves for later on. So often you'll be seeing multi-line strings like this in my files with explanations about what things are. Just one more thing, you can add strings together. So if you've got a name such as Jose and a greeting, you can add it to name and then we will end up with hello comma space Jose. So when you add two strings together, they are joined and make up one final string. So I will print out this greeting here and run the file and you'll see that we get hello Jose. If you do age is 34, and then you try to add this to a string, like here, you are plus 34, you will get an error because in Python, you cannot add integers and strings together. You must convert this to a string first before you can add them together. Fortunately, converting to a string is very straightforward. You can either add the quotation marks around it or you can do str and pass in age. What this does is it takes in the number 34, you give it to this str function, which has these brackets around it to accept a value. So you're giving the age value to str, and what you get back is a string with this content inside it. So then you can still run this because age as str is a string that you've converted. We will be learning more about converting data from one type to another as we move through the course, and it's a very common thing to do. But for now, that's it for this video. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to look at string formatting. In the last video, we saw how you cannot add numbers and strings together. But that is such a common thing to do that all too often we end up having to convert the number into a string so that we can add it to the string and so on. Something like this, which we had in the last video. We've got a number, then we want to put it inside the string so that we can show it to the user, and we have to convert it into a string first. This is quite annoying because it happens so often. So instead, we can use string formatting. So what I'm going to do is instead of printing you are 
plus the age, we're going to print f string. Now, an f string is only something available in Python 3.6 and above. So make sure that you are using that version. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, it will work in REPL8. And here we're going to do UR. And then inside a couple of curly braces, we're going to type age. Now we can delete this one here. And we can also delete this one there. And we can directly print the number 34 inside our string because of the way that F strings work. So in an F string, you type an F, then the quotation marks. And then inside the quotation marks, you can write these curly braces. And inside the curly brace, you can write your variable that you want to include inside your string. Let's look at another example. Here we've got a name. And then you've got a greeting, which is an F string. You see the F, then the quotation marks. And inside it, you've got how are you comma space. Then you've got your curly braces. And inside there, you've got the name variable. And at the end, you've got a question mark. If we print this greeting, and then we run this, you'll see that how are you Jose gets printed out. There is a small problem with F strings, which isn't really a problem as much as a limitation, which is that if you change the name, say to Bob, and then you print greeting again, you'll see that how are you Jose gets printed out twice. That is because when we calculated this string, the name variable was Jose, and that is what the greeting string contains. The greeting string contains how are you Jose, and even if you change name, the greeting doesn't change. That is why Python has another way of formatting strings, which does allow for the changing of variables. So let's delete this and create a final greeting, which is how are you, and then just open and closing curly braces without uh, the name variable inside it. And notice that this is not an F string. Now we can do another variable that is final greeting dot format and pass in the name. So this is a little bit different from what we've been seeing up to now. What this does is it takes in this string here, how are you comma curly braces question mark. And then it's going to run something called format inside it. And format has these brackets at the end, which means it can accept a value. And the value it's accepting is the name. What this does is it takes the name and it replaces the curly braces by the value. So if we print Jose greeting, then you'll see the same thing as before. How are you Jose? But now you can do something like Bob greeting and make it equal to final greeting dot format of the name Bob. And then we can print that out. So as you can see, if we change the name to Bob, then this line actually looks exactly the same as the one above, but the name is changing. So what we've got here is essentially a template for a greeting, and we can then replace the values into it later on if we want. Inside final greeting here, you can also put name if you want, but because it's not an F string, Python isn't going to try to put your variable inside the string. You must do it yourself. But if you put this in there, what you have to do is final greeting dot format. And now say name equal Jose. So what this does in Python is Python will know to look for the name thing inside curly braces and replace it by Jose. So this is a very important part of how Python works. And we'll be looking at it in great detail as we go along. But the first part before the equal, Python will know that is this thing here. And the second part is what you want to put there instead. Now here comes the confusing part, which is that you have a variable called name. So really, you can do name equal name. But these two refer to two completely different things. The first one, Python knows you refer to this thing here inside your greeting. And the second one after the equal, Python knows that you refer to your variable. 
Don't feel like you have to use this all the time, but it is there and you can use it if you want. One of the key benefits of doing something like this is that the template is now much more readable because it is obvious that you are going to print how are you and then somebody's name. In addition, it of course works if you change this variable name. Name, which is still being used inside the string, is now equal to friend underscore name, which is our variable. So this still works in the same way. Let's revert that. And now remember that name is going to be replacing just the curly braces because we don't have anything inside them, which is when we need to say name equals something. Instead of creating a variable called Jose greeting, you can actually just put this inside the print function, and that is totally fine as well. It's a little bit more confusing maybe, but it works in the same way. Usually you will be using f strings in Python just because they are shorter, they're more readable. You don't have to type like dot format and then brackets and then pass in things there. So f strings are the weapon of choice. But sometimes when you want to reuse a template, using format comes in handy. But that's it for this video. Hopefully I haven't confused you too much. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to learn about actually getting data from our users so that our programs can start being a bit more dynamic. Imagine you've got your name and it's Jose and you want the user's name but how do you get it? Do you expect the user to edit the program so that they can put their name in here? Finally what you want to do is to print you know something like hello your name, my name is my name. Let's say we have a simple program like this. So how do you get the user's name? Because if you run this right now, you'll get hello empty string, my name is Jose. If the user has to come in and edit the program, then you know, this will work, right? But how are you gonna share this with users that don't know any programming? So what we have to do is we have to first ask the user for their name, allow them to type something here in this text console, and then use that name inside our program. So here is where the input function comes in. So we will type input, enter your name. And what this is going to do is it's going to open up a prompt here in the console. And notice that the program is stopped until we press the enter key. So if I type Rolf now, then you'll see that we get back, hello Rolf, my name is Jose. This tells you one thing about the input function, which is that the thing that the user typed came back to us and it must have been a string because it contains characters. It is not an integer and it is not a float. Otherwise, you know, it would have to be numbers and you would be able to do maths on it. So it must be a string. And that is something that always happens with the input function. Anything the user types, even if it is the number 35, is a string, a string that contains the characters three and five. With that in mind, let's try something else. Let's try asking the user for their age. And then we're going to print, you have lived for age times 12 months. So a very popular first program, we're going to ask the user for their age and then we're going to say, for example, imagine they enter three there, we're going to say you have lived for 36 months, right? But remember that the age variable has a string in it. The input function always gives you back a string, even if you enter a number. So we aren't turning this into a number what is going to happen when we multiply a string by 12? Well, let me type three in here. And you get three, 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 three. You get 12 threes. Because age times 12 is more or less the same as age plus age plus age plus age 12 times. And remember what happens when we add two strings together? 
they get joined together. They get concatenated. So by multiplying a string by a number, really what you're getting is 12 of those strings. What you have to do is you have to turn it into an integer. So the same way that we used str to turn a integer or a, another number into a string, we can use int or int to turn a string into an integer. So we will turn age into an integer and put it inside age underscore num, and then we will do age num times 12. And that works just as well. Now, something important about Python that you're going to see quite a lot is that when you evaluate one of these things here, that becomes the value that the user has given you. So here's what I mean. This text that I've got selected here is three when your program runs. So if the user is going to enter three in your program, this entire text I've got selected is exactly identical to you just typing three in there. Means exactly the same thing. Of course, the user can enter something different if they'd like. So this is why this is a dynamic value. But if they enter three, it's the same thing as having three in there. If they enter 35, it's the same thing as having 35 in there. So we could do age equal int of 35, right? And then we would not need this age num there, and we could do this. But how do we get the dynamic value instead of the static 35 string? We use the input function that we had just a moment ago. So you can do this in Python because the things inside the brackets always run first. So the input function will run and the program will wait until the user presses enter. And then this entire selected text will be replaced by what the user enters. For example, the string three. And then we will pass that to the int function, which will give us an integer equivalent to the string that we got passed. So we will get the integer three. And then we will put that inside age. This type of nesting is very common and you will be doing this quite often. However, it's also easy to, you know, go a bit overboard with it. You don't want to be doing that. You don't want to nest like 20 times. Otherwise, the code gets almost unreadable. But a couple of functions inside each other can actually shorten your code and make it a bit easier to read. Remember, what we had before is we had an age variable, and then we also had an age num variable. But the age variable was only useful to calculate age num. It wasn't used anywhere else in our program. So it's kind of pointless to keep it around. We might as well nest these here and only have one variable that we actually want and use, and not have two variables, one of which is pointless. Now, instead of doing the multiplication inside the f string, which you can do, we can separate this into a new variable. Why might you do that? Well, the main reason for separating a value like that into a variable is so that you can give it a name that has meaning. Now, when you read this program, it's pretty obvious that first you're getting the user's age, then you're calculating how many months that equals to, and then you're printing that out. And it's quite obvious because your variable is called months. If your variable was called x, then it might not be so obvious until you read through the entire thing. Giving variables good names, good descriptive names, is a bit of an art form and it can be quite tricky at times, but it's really important. You will get better at it over time. In the next lecture, we've got a small exercise for you, which is to, instead of printing the number of months the user has lived for, you can print the number of seconds they have lived for. Just slightly different maths here, but more or less the same. Do try to complete that exercise on your own without looking back at this code. And if you've forgotten how to do it, then do look back, of course, so that you can complete the exercise. Through practice and through typing code, you're going to learn much faster than just by watching the videos. That's everything for this one, though. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck with the exercise. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to learn about booleans. In Python we've got true and false values 
and they are used to make decisions. For example, is the user's age over 35? That could be a comparison that we evaluate to true or false. In Python, the keywords are true with a capital T and false with a capital F. Here I've created two variables, one of them called truthy, and that has a true value, and one called falsy, and that has a false value. But on their own, this is kind of pointless, because what can you use true for? There's, there's not much use for just something true. But when you've got a number, you can then say whether is over age, and type age greater than or equal to 18. So here we've got our first Boolean comparison. We've got uh, the variable, then we've got an equal sign, which means that this variable is going to be a name for this value here. And the value is age greater than or equal to 18. This here is a Boolean comparison, and it evaluates to true, because 20 is greater than or equal to 18. So doing this here is exactly the same as doing true. We can have is under age, which means age is less than 18. And here, this would be false, because age is 20. So 20 is not less than 18. This would be false. Do note that I'm not doing age less than or equal to 18, as when you are 18, you are allegedly over age in most countries. So this one has to be less than only. Finally, you can also check whether is 20, for example, and type age equal equal 20. Now, this can get a bit confusing because you now have three equal signs in one line. When you have a single equal sign, that is used for assignment. What it says is, this value here, we're going to give it this name. So, we will calculate the value first, and then put the name and give it to it. Two equal signs is not used for assignment, it is used for comparison. And what it means is exactly equal to. So what it's saying is, is the age variable exactly equal to 20? And the answer is yes, so this whole thing here actually evaluates to true. Other symbols that you can use are of course greater than on its own, and less than or equal to, like that. Let's create a simple program that will ask the user for a number, and then we will tell them whether it matches our magic number. So we will have our number, which is 5, and then we will ask the user for a number, like that. And then we will say my number equal to user number. So as long as they enter 5, this will be true. And if they enter anything else, then it is false. To make this a little bit better, you can create a new variable which has the value of whether it matches or not. And then you can use an f string to say you got it right, matches. And then if we run this and we type 5, you say you got it right, true. Later on in the course, we're going to learn how to say you got it right or you got it wrong. But at the moment, we really can't do that. We need something called an if statement in order to be able to do that. And we're going to learn about that in the next section. But for now, you have the ability to get information from the user and compare it to something that you already have. And then determine one thing or another, whether something is true or false. In the next video, we will learn more about working with Booleans and making our programs much more flexible. I'll see you there. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to learn about two Python keywords, AND and OR. Let's start by asking the user for their age. Then we're going to determine whether the user has a age good enough to learn programming. So what we'll do is can learn programming and we'll say age is greater than zero. Here we have created a Boolean comparison, age greater than zero, and we have given it the name can learn programming. 
However, sometimes users can be too old to learn programming. So we can use the Python keyword and, and for example, age less than 150. And what this does is it says, if the age is greater than zero and the age is less than 150, then the whole thing is true. If the age is not greater than zero, then the whole thing is false. And if age is greater than 150, then the whole thing is false. So if we enter our age here, then we will get, you can learn programming true. By the way, let me say at this point, there is no limit to learning programming. You can learn programming at any age. And that's because programming is all about problem solving and it's not really all that much about learning syntax or working with uh, difficult tools or anything like that. All right, now that we've got and out of the way, we're gonna learn more about it in just a moment. Let's ask the user again for their age. And now we will ask them whether they are usually retired. So we will have usually not working. And this will be if the age is less than 18, people are usually not working. Or if the age is greater than 65, people are usually not working because they're retired. So then we can print at age, you are usually not working and then usually not working like that. So let's run this. And if we enter 34, then we will get at 34, you are usually not working, false. If we run it again and we type 10, at 10, you are usually not working, true. Although you are going to school, which is pretty complicated as well at times. Now, there is a small problem with this Boolean. Usually, you don't want to write Booleans as negatives because it can get quite confusing to read later on. So ideally, you would want to have usually working instead. If you have a Boolean like this, then it's easier to think about. Just the same way that in English, you know, double negatives can get quite confusing. In programming, working with negatives is an added strain on your brain that you want to avoid generally. So we can rewrite this to usually working. And what that means is that they have to be age greater than or equal to 18 or age less than or equal to 65. And that is when people are usually working. So if we run this, then we type 65, then at 65 usually working true. So that's unfortunate, but that is how it goes these days. So how does it work internally? Here we've got another function called bool. This is similar to int and str in that it takes in the value and converts it to a boolean. So what will we get if we turn 35 into a boolean? Well, you get true. So what if you turn the string Rolf into a boolean? Well, you get true as well. So what happens if you change these to zero and empty string? Now you get false. So in Python, there are some values that when converted into a Boolean, evaluate to true or false. Most values evaluate to true, but things like zero, 0, 0.0, empty string, and things like that evaluate to false. So here's how and and or work for real. If you have true and false, what and is doing is it's gonna look at the first value. Is it true? And if the first value is true, then it's gonna give you the second value. So we will say x equal true and false, and then print x. And what this is gonna do is, again, look at the first value, it's true, so it gives you the second one. So if we print x, you get false. And this is very easy to double check with something that isn't true and false. So we'll do 35 and zero. And again, it's gonna look at the first value. It's gonna look and see if it's true. And if it is, then it's gonna give you the second one. So you get zero. Remember, it knows that this is a true value because if you pass it through bool, it evaluates to true. So, and the way it works, is it gives you the first value if it is false. If the first value is true, then it gives you the second value. So if we put zero first and 35 after, 
again it gives you the first value which is the zero or works in slightly the opposite way or will give you the first value if it is true otherwise it will give you the second value so if the first value is true it will give you the first value otherwise it will give you the second value so here it gives you 35 because 35 is true and if you do the other way around zero is false so it gives you the second value again 35 you can use this in quite a lot of places actually for example imagine you've got a name and a surname and it just so happens that the user hasn't given you their name so you can do something like greeting could be name or Mr. Surname assuming that you know that the person is going to be a man of course so you can then run this and you get Mr. Smith why? because name is an empty string which means it is false or it is false C when you pass it through bool so instead of giving you the first value the or gives you the second value this is even better if you add in user input let's run this again and now I'm going to not give them my name because I care deeply about my privacy so I don't want to give them my name but I will give them my surname and then it prints out Mr. Salvatierra there so situations like this one which may seem useless to you at the moment are actually all over programming so knowing how AND and OR work internally can be really useful so again to recap AND gives you the first value if it is false and otherwise it gives you the second one and OR gives you the first value if it is true otherwise it gives you the second one finally you've also got uh, NOT and that essentially does the opposite so not false is going to be true and not true is going to be false so this is how the not keyword operates it goes in front of a boolean and it does the opposite of whatever that boolean is so for example not bool of 35 will give you false because bool 35 is true so not true is false if you do not of 35 you also get false because Python realizes that not uh, is something that you use with a boolean so it turns the 35 into a boolean before applying not I appreciate that this video has been a little bit confusing do bear with me as we go into more advanced programming territory and if you have any questions ask them away in the course Q&A we're always there to help thanks for joining me in this one and I'll see you in the next video hi guys and welcome back in this video we're going to talk about lists lists allow us to store multiple values in a single variable for example imagine you've got a program that contains the names of your friends you could start off with something like this but of course you can imagine that as your program grows this becomes less and less feasible you have to keep adding variables and not only that but working with these variables becomes increasingly difficult for example if you wanted to print out who your friends are you would have to say you know print friend 1 and then you have to print friend 2 and then friend 3 and if you add more you would have to add more print statements and that means that as your code grows it grows more and more and more exponentially and that means that this code is not going to be very easy to work with it's much better if we create a list like this now we've got a single variable friends and that name describes very well what it contains which is the names of our friends to create a list we use square brackets and inside the list we put the different values separated by commas so what we've got here is a list of three strings the first one is Rolf, the second one is Bob, and the third one's Anne. If we want to access the value of a 
single friend, you would do friends, and then using square brackets again, you would put zero, for example. And what this does is it accesses the first element of the list. Notice that in computing, we start counting at zero. So element zero is the first element, element one is the second element, and so on. So if we run this, you'll see that Rolf gets printed out because that's the first element there. Similarly, if we print friends one, you'll see Bob printed out. Notice that you can put anything you want inside a list. So you could put two in there if you wanted to, but this is highly discouraged. Generally, you want to keep data inside a list homogeneous. And what this means is you want to keep it all related and all the same. For example, here, if you've got a list called friends, you probably want to keep your friends in that list. If you have a list called furniture, you would want to keep strings describing the furniture in that list. If you see something like this out there in some code that you read somewhere else, it probably means that the programmer in question started writing some code about furniture and then decided to write about friends instead. And generally when you do this, you want to make sure that your variables do change while you can do this, it's generally discouraged because the data inside the list is no longer described by the variable name. And so this can be a bit confusing. If you see a variable called friends, what's the two? Does that mean you have two friends? Is it something else? Maybe one of your friends is called two. So keep the data inside your lists homogeneous, and that's going to make your life much easier as you program more. Of course, if you did want to get the amount of elements in the list, say two, you don't have to put the two inside the list. You can just print the len of friends. So if you do len and then inside the brackets, you put the list, this is gonna give you the length of the list or the size of it. So if we run this, you'll get two out because that's the number of elements in this list, Rolf and Anne. You can put anything you want inside a list. So it doesn't have to be strings or numbers. You can put other lists if you want. For example, let's create a list of friends and their ages. So here this outer list denoted by these square brackets outside of every other element has three lists inside it. This one, that one, and this one. Each of those lists has two elements inside it. Those two in this list, Bob and 30 in this list, and Anne and 27 in the final list. If you wanted to access a specific element, for example, Rolf, all you have to do is access the first element of the outer list, and that is friends zero, and then the first element of the inner list. So when you do friends zero, what you're getting back is this list here. What happens in Python is that this is replaced essentially by this list. So now if you want to access the first element of this list, you just put another zero inside square brackets at the end. So this here is this list and all of this is Rolf. Similarly, if you wanted to access Bob's age, for example, you could do friends one, one. When you have a long list such as this one, it's usually good form to split it out into multiple lines like this, the square brackets in their own lines. And then with some spacing in front, although it is not required, but it is generally used, you can put each of the sublists in there. Indeed, if it's a list of strings, say, you can also put each string in their own line just so it's a bit easier to read. This clearly shows that you've got a long list and this is each element in the list and you can see they're comma separated at the end. Do pay close attention when you are writing lists that you have the commas in the right place. Here we've got a comma inside this inner list, which means it's got two elements. And then we've got a comma afterwards, which separates this element from other elements in the outer list. Just something to pay close attention to. Let's go back to our friends list with just strings and look at how to add to one of these. To add to a list, all you have to do is type the list name dot append. And what that's going to do is it's going to add a name or indeed add anything to the list at the end. That's what append means. So if we print friends now, you'll see that we've got four elements inside the friends list. 
Similarly, you can remove from a list if you want by doing friends.remove and then say Bob. Now, if we print this, you'll see that it's only got two elements, Rolf and Anne. Something to remember is that if you have a list of lists, for example, and you want to remove one of these sublists, you've got to say friends.remove and then everything you want to remove. So that's Anne, say, 27. And what this means is you're going to remove from the friends list, which is all of this, the value of this list. So this entire list is going to go away. If you just do Anne, Python is going to say Anne doesn't exist in this list because this list contains three things. This, that, and that. And Anne is not one of those things. What is one of those things, though, is this entire list, Anne with 27 in it. So if we print friends now, you'll see that that entirely disappears and you're left with just the two other lists inside your friends list. Hopefully this makes sense. Lists are a very useful data structure and they're everywhere in Python and you're going to be using them a lot throughout your programming. If you're not sure when you would want to use a list versus a string, don't worry too much about it. Over the coming videos, we're going to be getting more experience with using lists as well as some other data structures that we'll be looking at. And you will learn more about when and how to use them. So with that said, I'll see you in the next video. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to talk about tuples. Tuples are very similar to lists in that they are used to store multiple pieces of information, but there is a small subtle difference between tuples and lists. Let's jump right in. A tuple can be defined like this. Let's imagine you've got a short tuple that contains two of your friend names. You can just say Rolf, Bob. Notice that there are no square brackets now around these two strings, but there is a comma in between them. So you've got one string and then another string. This is a tuple. You can think of it as almost the same thing as a list, but I'll show you the difference in just a moment. It's often good form to put brackets around this. So this is a bit clearer. If you put brackets around the two strings like that, this is a little bit clearer that it's a tuple. And almost all of the time you're going to see tuples defined with the brackets around them. But remember that the brackets are not required in many cases. Although there are some cases where they will be. And that is when Python cannot be sure if the comma is used to separate two things inside a tuple or something else. For example, Here's uh, an occasion where you will need to use the brackets, which is when you want to put a tuple inside a list. If you have a list and you want to put a tuple inside it and you do it like this, you have not put a tuple inside the list. What you've done is you've created a list of two elements, as we saw in the last video. If you want to create a list with a tuple inside it, you will need the brackets so that Python knows that you intend this to evaluate first, which creates a tuple, and then the list to evaluate later. That's what brackets are normally used for in mathematics as well, to signal order of evaluation. So most of the time you're going to see your tuples defined with brackets around them, and I would encourage you to get accustomed to that notation as well. Something very important is that while you can write your tuples like this, this thing is most definitely not a tuple, if you just write Rolf. If you write Rolf on its own, that's just a string. But if you add Rolf and then a comma, Python knows that you want a tuple there. And this, adding a comma at the end, is something that a lot of my students make as a mistake when they're starting up. They just put a comma at the end because, you know, maybe they come from a different programming language or maybe it's a typo or a small mistake. And this can cause some trouble. So make sure to not put commas at the end of your statements in Python because that turns strings or anything else into tuples. And that can be a bit confusing. So I've got this tuple here with my friend names, Rolf, Bob, and Anne. And let's say I want to add something to this tuple. Like we learned with lists, friends.append, and then gen. So if we run this now, you'll see that we'll get an error. And it says, attribute error, this is the name of the error, tuple object has no attribute append. 
And here it tells you the line in which the error occurred, which is line two of our code. What this means is that you can't do dot append on a tuple. Okay, so how do you add to a tuple if you can't append to it? Well, that's the thing. You cannot add to a tuple. Here we've got a tuple of three elements and you cannot insert an extra element on this tuple. All you can do is say friends equal friends plus gen like that. So you can add two tuples together, in this case the friends tuple and the gen tuple with a single element, add those two and say that friends is now equal to the result of adding them. Remember when you do an equal sign, the right side evaluates first. So this thing here uses the current value of friends and this new tuple and then you give it the name friends. So you can reassign while using a variable in the assignment. That's totally fine. It just uses the last value of the variable if it existed. You can do this if you want, and that will result in a tuple of four elements. But what's important and an important distinction is that the tuple itself did not change. You created a new one, which contains now four elements. And while that's relatively unimportant right now, it will become important as you learn more Python. So that is the key difference between lists and tuples. Lists, you can add and remove elements. Tuples, you cannot. So that's the key difference. Tuples are useful for when you want to keep them unchanged. Most of the time, I'd recommend using tuples over lists and only use lists when you specifically want to allow modification or changes. Again, at the moment, this may not make much sense, but you will find more meaning in that as you learn more. Trust me on that one. That's everything for this video, though. We've learned about tuples. I'll see you on the next one. Hi, guys, and welcome back. In this video, we will be learning about sets. Sets are another collection, like lists and tuples, that contain multiple values inside them. But, of course, there has to be a difference between sets and the other two, otherwise there would be no point to them. And the key difference is that sets don't hold order and sets don't contain duplicate elements. So, let's have a look at our art friends, our friends who study art. And let's say those are Rolf and Anne. Here I've defined my first set. And you can denote a set by using these curly braces instead of the square brackets or the normal brackets. Square brackets for a list, normal brackets for a tuple. By using curly braces, Python knows that you are defining a set. So here we've got our first set, art friends, and now let's define science friends. So just Jen and Charlie. If you want to add to a set, you just do something like artfriends.add and then add Jen. What this is going to do is it's going to add the gen string into the art friends set and it's going to sort of put it anywhere in that set. Remember, sets don't keep order, so it could be anywhere. It could be at the start, it could be in the middle, it could be at the end. And there is no guarantee on the order being kept throughout the program either. So whenever you print the set, it could be in a different order. So let's print it out and run it. You can see that in this case, the gen string has been printed at the start, then Anne and then Rolf. If you try to do this again, you'll see that the same set gets printed out twice. Because we tried to add a value to the set that was already there, it didn't happen. Nothing happened, no error happens, just the value does not get added. It's already in there and sets do not contain duplicate elements, so nothing gets added to that set. You can remove things from a set though by doing dot remove. And now you can see that the second time we printed, Jen is gone because we removed her in line eight. So this is how to work with sets in a very basic form, but it doesn't show you why sets are useful. One of the key use cases about sets is that it's very easy to compare one set to another. For example, ask sets, what elements are in this set that are not in this other set? or what elements are common between both sets. Things like that are why sets are useful. So let's look at those operations in the next video. I'll see you there.
Welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at some advanced set operations, which is why sets are useful compared to lists and tuples. So what I've got here is my art friends and my science friends. In art, we've got Rolf, Anne and Jen, and in science, we've got Jen and Charlie. So a couple of things you can notice about these sets is that Jen does both art and science, right? She's in both sets. Rolf and Anne do art, but not science. And Charlie does science, but not art. And in total, we have four people, Rolf, Anne, Jen, and Charlie. So we can use sets to extract that information from this data. Here's how. Let's get those people that do art, but not science. So we'll say art, but not science. And what you want to do is you want to say art friends dot difference science friends. So the difference gives you which elements are in art that are not in science. So the ones that are in art but not in science means that it's going to do Rolf, Anne and Jen. It's going to take away all the elements that are here that are also here. So in this case, Jen is in both. So it's going to get taken away. And what you'll get back is Rolf and Anne. Of course, you can do science, but not art. And it's just the opposite, science friends, difference, art friends. And what that's going to do, it's going to take your science friends, Jen and Charlie, and it's going to take away those that are in art, so Jen. And it's going to leave you just with Charlie. Let's print those out. And you'll see what I mean. So in the first one, you have Anne and Rolf, but not Jen. And in the second one, you have Charlie, but not Jen. Sometimes what you want is something called the symmetric difference, which is members that aren't in both sets. So what members are not in both sets? Rolf, Anne, and Charlie. So let's get that. So not in both will be art friends dot symmetric difference science friends. So you get Anne, Rolf and Charlie. So those are the members that are not in both. Since Jen is the only one that's in both, what you end up is everything together except the ones that are in both. Of course, because it's a symmetric difference, it doesn't matter which one goes first. You can put science friends dot symmetric difference art friends, or you can do what we've done here, art friends dot symmetric difference science friends. So to recap, difference does elements that are in one, but not the other where a symmetric difference does elements that are not in both. If you wanted the members that are in both sets, so Jen, you can do that with something called the intersection. So you could do who is doing art and science, art and science, and that would be art friends dot intersection with science friends. And what that would give you is just Jen in her own set. Notice that this is still a set because it has the curly braces around it. So that is a set of one element. Finally, if you wanted all the people that are studying any subject, but without duplicates, you could do all friends is art friends dot union with science friends. And that is going to unite both sets and give you one big set with everybody in it. Of course, note that Jen is there twice, so it's only going to appear once in the final set because sets cannot contain duplicates, and you can see that this is still a set, so there are no duplicates in it. These operations are why sets are useful. For example, you could have a lottery game where your user has a few numbers and the system has decided on six numbers that are the lottery winners. By having them both on sets, you could calculate the intersection of them two, which elements the user has matched with the winning elements, and then calculate the user's winnings like that. And that is, in fact, going to be one of the challenges for this section. If you're not completely sure when to use each of these data structures, lists, tuples, and sets, don't worry too much. Over time, you will get better at it. And most of the time, you'll be using tuples and lists. Sets are reserved for when you want to use these operations. Thanks for joining me in this video. I hope you've learned something, and I'll see you in the next one.
Hi guys and welcome back. In this video, we're going to learn about dictionaries. When you look in a dictionary for a word definition, you're performing a key search. What that means is that you know what you want to search for, such as the word algorithm, say, and when you go into the dictionary and you find the word algorithm, you get back some values or the definitions of algorithm. That is more or less what a dictionary is in Python. A dictionary allows you to store keys and values, and it's useful for when you know the key and you want to get the value back. Let's have a look. Imagine you want a dictionary of friend ages. What you would do is you would use curly braces as you did with sets, and then you would type Rolf colon 24. Here you've got your first dictionary. Of course, a dictionary of a single element is hardly useful. You might as well just have it on its own piece of paper. So you can have multiple elements here, like that. So here we have a dictionary of three elements, Rolf, Adam, and Anne. If you wanted to get Rolf's age, you need to know what you are looking for. And that is the string Rolf, that's the key. And then you would get back 24, which is the value. Very similar to how a real dictionary works, where you know what you're looking for, say algorithm, and you get back the definitions of the word. If you wanted to find Rolf's age, you can do print and then friend ages, which is the dictionary, and then inside square brackets, you put what you're looking for. So Rolf. Python will know that Rolf is a key in the dictionary and it will give you back 24. So this thing here will become the value 24. Let's run this and show you. You can see that 24 comes out because that is the value associated with the key Rolf in our dictionary. You can always add keys to a dictionary by doing friend ages and then something like Bob equal 20. Now, important here is that what you're doing is you are accessing a key of the dictionary and you are setting a value in it. I see some people trying to do something like this. This is invalid Python. You cannot do this because you are not accessing the key in the dictionary. You are trying to access the key and the value in one place, which you can't do. Also forget about doing this friend ages bob colon 20 this won't work either because the colon is only used here inside the dictionary it's not used for assignment of new values so this is how you assign a value to a key in the dictionary even if the key doesn't exist yet of course that means that you can change an existing key in the dictionary if you want say rolf's birthday passes you can set friend ages of rolf to 25. Let's print friend ages and you'll see that Rolf is 25 and Bob is 20. There you have Bob at the end and Rolf as well. A difference between dictionaries and sets is that dictionaries do keep the order in which you added keys to them as of Python 3.7. But like in sets, you cannot have duplicate keys in a dictionary. Indeed, if you already have Rolf in the dictionary, and you try to add Rolf again, all that's gonna happen is you're gonna change Rolf. You're not gonna add it again. So you cannot have duplicate keys, but the order is kept as of Python 3.7. Before that, the order was not guaranteed. Imagine you have a program that stores information about your friends. If you have multiple friends and you wanna store multiple pieces of information about them, the best thing to do is to use a list or a tuple of dictionaries. So we will do friends, equal and then a tuple and inside it we will put the name of our friend and the age of our friend so what you've got here is a tuple with three elements inside it and it's very normal to define longer lists and tuples like this with the starting bracket and ending bracket in their own line and then indented with four spaces the values Putting four spaces, or indeed any number of spaces, in front of a line is called indentation, by the way. So what we've got here is a very typical use case of dictionaries, which is to store information in a way that will be easily retrievable and in a way that is similar to other dictionaries that are related. Here's what I mean by that. If you wanted a friend's name, 
you know that you can access one of these elements and then the key name and that's going to give you the name of the person if you did this which is what we had earlier then you cannot access the name of each friend you would need to know the name of each friend before you can access the value so by doing something like this what that allows us to do is to say print friends zero name for example what we're doing here is we're accessing the first element of the tuple which is this dictionary and then the name property of the dictionary which is rolf smith notice that this is getting a little bit longer so something you can do is you can do something like friend is friends zero and then you can do print friend name this is exactly the same thing but now you are splitting a variable out first so that it's a bit more readable because you can do this and i'm actually going to revert back to it so it's a little bit easier to copy and paste you can simply increase the number there zero one two and you're always accessing the name property of the dictionary and it's always going to give you the friend's name and this can be particularly useful when you have a lot of friends or a lot of data in your lists and in your tuples and you want the data to be homogeneous so that you can always access the same key for each piece of data you'll see more about why this is useful in the later sections of the course I also wanted to tell you about another function which is called dict which is used to turn data into a dictionary here we've got a list of tuples where there are three elements in our list these tuples Rolf comma 24 Adam comma 30 and Anne comma 27 you can very easily turn this into a dictionary by passing it to the dict function here so we're doing dict and then inside brackets putting friends what you end up with is something like what we had at the start of the video Rolf 24 Adam 30 and 27 so this can be useful because there are many different parts of Python that will give you data in this format instead of a dictionary and turning them into a dictionary like this can be really handy over the next few videos and the next few sections we're going to be using this every now and then so I just wanted to introduce it to you now so you know how it works but don't worry when we come to it we will explain it further as well thanks for joining me in this video I hope you've learned something and I'll see you in the next one Hi and welcome back. In this video I just wanted to introduce to you another function called the sum that along with length we can use to calculate an average of a list. Imagine you've got your grades and you have something like 80, 75, 90 and 100 and you want to calculate the average of these grades. Something you could do is you could sum up all of the grades by doing something like total equal sum of grades and this is the new function I wanted to tell you about you've got the sum function and inside the brackets you put in the list or tuple or set that you want to add together and that is going to add all the values together and give you the grand total you've also got length which is len of grades and we've seen this before but I'll forgive you if you've forgotten about this len gives you the length of the collection so in this case this list is going to give us four you can then calculate the average by doing total divided by length just like that you get 86.25 now this is a perfect opportunity for a quick question which of these data structures is less ideal for grades you've got a list of grades you've got a tuple of grades and you've got a set of grades the tuple of grades may seem like a bad choice because you cannot add new grades over time and indeed if you are currently in the middle of your program say and you want to be adding more grades as students take exams or the user gives you some more data or something like that then the tuple might be a bad choice but the set is actually the worst choice here because if you have a set of grades you cannot have another 100% on another test, say. Because if you put 100 and 100 in a set, 
one of them will be removed because you cannot have duplicates. So in this case, I would say that the set is the worst of these collections for the use case, storing student grades. The tuple might be a bad idea depending on what you want to do in your program. And the list is the safest of them all. It allows you total flexibility while it all the, giving you all the power you need. Again, remember, if you do not have to add more things to your collection, I would use a tuple. Otherwise, I would use the list. And finally, I would only use sets for when you want to compare sets together. Thanks for joining me in this video. I hope you've learned something and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video, I wanted to tell you about Join. Join allows you to print out your lists a bit better. Imagine you've got a list of friends and you want to print it out in a string. You want to say something like, my friends are friends. If we run this, you'll see that you get my friends are and then, you know, square brackets and then string Rolf, string and string Charlie. Maybe you want to print it out a bit more nicely. So what you can do, create a new variable, comma separated, for example, and then type comma space dot join friends. And what this is going to do is it's going to get the different values in this list and it's going to join them together using the comma as the separator. So here's what you'll end up with. Let's say we print my friends are comma separated. And then we run this. You'll see that the output is a little bit different. Now you get my friends are Rolf and Charlie. What's happened here is we've taken each of the values of the list and we've made one long string, which is all of this stuff here. The comma and the space is used as the separator between values in a list. But you can use anything else you want. Uh, for example, that. It won't be as nice to read, of course, but just to show you that these are how it's printed out, you can see my friends are Rolf and Anne and Charlie. If you wanted this last one to say and, so that the output would be my friends are Rolf and Anne Charlie, you're actually going to have to wait a little bit because we need to learn a few more things before we can do specific things just with the last element of the list. When we cover list slicing in the next section, you'll be able to do that. But for now, thanks for joining me. I hope you've learned something. I'll see you in the next video.